freaking out, ridiculous lovers and other freaks. Who has not been through it? A complete loss of all dignity and pride, of self-esteem and everything you thought was yours forever, just because some silly incident, some awkward situation, something perfectly ridiculous and accidental, such as finding your wife's lover in her bed, an operetta situation, humanly deplorable and perfectly preposterous, and all you ever dreamed of is forgotten, crushed and broken up in pieces, with a broken heart and tears and years ahead of misery, remorse and sorrow, all because of human weakness, everybody being really innocent. But that is how it starts, the real romance, the suffering, the pathos, the profundity and melancholy, and you melt away in sweet sentimentality and self-pity forever, drowning all your sorrows in a glass that never ends, the chalice of your martyrdom being refilled forever. That's how the career begins for the professional freak, who never more can be quite certain of his sex. He can do anything for love, turn homosexual or bisexual or whatever, but will never turn a lesbian unless he becomes a woman, which of course could be another choice of his or hers, depending on what sex or kind of sex he chooses, if she suddenly becomes a man or he a woman. So, in brief, enjoy yourself, whatever kind of sex you have or are. Labyrinths of love what shall we say? Resign and give up in pathetical dismay? My friend, be comforted. Your love is never lost and never wasted. Never can it be expressed in vain. And if you lose a girl or all the girls of this frustrating world, then you can find some wise guys, say, another kind of girl. And sweetheart, lover, partner and whatever in yourself. Now what freak kind of comfort is that miserable bullshit? Sorry, I just tell you what they have been telling me. The experts, those who never love except to lose their love, who have seen all the tragedies and managed to survive them, and themselves, their love and their repetitive perdition. There is always a way out, they say, and if you cannot find it, just go back into yourself and find your other self within yourself. In brief, turn schizophrenic like so many do successfully. And so they freak out the advisers, the psychologists, the head shrinkers, support teams, pimps and gigolos, and you just scrap them all as good for nothing. And having given up completely, getting ready for the exit, a dramatic, most spectacular, demonstrative, resounding, bloodily, impressing suicide, you will find a friend right there just waiting for you, and you ask him with surprise, Where have you been? He answers, or if it is she, Well, I just happen to be here. Nothing ever fails to turn up when you least expect it, and you simply will continue be surprised, as long as you give life a chance. Separation. What separated us? Alas, we are both innocent of our fates, which we have to follow and which teach us all kinds of uncomfortable and undesired lessons, and for some reason our very striving for nobility has become the parting wall, sealing us off from each other robbed of our souls and our free will by the very thing we have in common, our ideals and vocation, our very work which brought us together and now has turned itself into a wall casting us in different prisons. Our only salvation is our souls, if we still can find some contact, in spite of the total and fatal separation across the ocean of division if our minds can find each other independent of our bodies, with a weakness fettering us to worldly troubles of pettiness, the trivial cause of our separation, 
the unacceptable sabotaging matters of unnecessary inconvenience. And fortunately we have some experience before of the ultimate phenomenon that nothing is impossible for true love of sincerest honesty. The environmentalists' concern, disturbances, nothing works properly anymore. There are disturbances everywhere, sabotaging life, messing up communication lines, turning nature into havoc, threatening life and the very existence of man because of man's own folly, who doesn't understand that he can't be unnatural without upsetting the universe, life and his own existence. Never earlier have so many life forms died out. Never has man been more violent and self-destructive. Never before has any form of life turned into a threat to life itself, like man does now in his totally absurd egoism. What can we do? Eliminate the disturbances, keep them out of our lives, close up the omnipresent noise pollution, turn back to nature and plant trees, abandon the brainwash society, and be human, kind and gentle, cue the psychotic illness of stress and go operate with life instead of doing everything to destroy it. No one has an enemy except himself if he turns into one and that's the only possible departure from nature, life and reason. The lover to the loved Stay a while, my love, and keep me company just for the night and you shall not regret it. For the more you give, the more you will be given, and I will not give you up, because you are my soul, that is, you are my life. You hold it in your hands, and there is no more life for me except your love. I know this borders on the burning out and draining of our energies. There is no more exhausting thing than love, and yet we need it and can't live without it, even if it must consume us in the end like in the slowest kind of suicide, but it gives so much pleasure on the way, and above all, much more life than we already possess. Profundity. Why can't we have each other, and yet we have each other? Destiny blocks our ways and seals us off. For her own purpose, it seems, the mystery of our love that constantly spurred on and brought to darker depths of infinite affection and intimacy, but without ever getting too close, as if our love was more a water story of unfathomable ocean depths than of any fire that could burn. Maybe it is better that way, never to consume or be consumed, but to be drowned instead, in the vastness of a sea that never ends, but only waxes all the time in greater overwhelmingness of beauty. Castles in the air. One day we'll realize our dreams and talk forever during endless hours of a sleepless night of only love and love again until we stifle in our sweat and bliss and wonderful exhaustion, something that we all need, not just you and me. Evasive dreams that never can come true, but always can be dreamed about, are always necessary to talk out about, because that is the way to share them, and not have them just for mirages, reserved for wishful thinking. And that way, at least, can they be kept alive and even verifiable, there is no greater joy and food for love than to share common dreams of definite impossibility, because that proves them not impossible at all, since what two people can conceive together is what they together also can create and out of nothing. Lenvoy, the wise guys, from an old Swedish song. When beauty came along, the wise guys had a song. We did not ask for her to come here. 
and they fired her and kicked her down the alley, for they knew much better how to manage without beauty than to let her enter any of their frozen hearts. And thus they lived on without any dance or song, or anything that possibly could risk their mind control, for they preferred to live without beauty, rather than to risk any joy or tears or dangerous emotion. For the wisdom of these wise guys is so advanced in its foresight that roses and orchids will freeze in its dry coldness to death, and people and pupils who are made to read their textbooks of elaborate pedantic instructions about rules and law and order will be petrified by such outstandingly premeditated brainwash to never have bright eyes or searching intellects again. Instead, they were compelled to physically work hard with a brute force but all the diligence served only others and their masters, those who taught them to mind only their own business and to count their hard-earned money since it was so little and to hate what tempted them to laughter and to some enjoyment of, for instance, beauty in some flowers of some garden. But we will have summer once again, or so the songs will sing, and heaven will continue beaming forth some sunshine. Much will pass that wasn't of much pleasure, and our hearts shall be uplifted once again. For beauty never comes or goes but to come back again. So will the songs forever sing, and nothing can shut up them, although no wise guy in this world will ever heed them, refusing to believe their nonsense to be better than their wisdom. Anonymitet. Man är begraven levande i gråhetens sterilitet. Dödgrävaren och mördaren är den likgiltighetens styrstnad som är vakmet man fötts i och som aldrig svikit den hur hårt man än har arbetat och kämpat för att i rättvisans namn utbryta sig ur detta skal av isolering, onaturlighet och brist på andlig livsluft. Själen föddes fri med egna vingar, men har aldrig givits luft att väckla ut dem, men stängts in trälbunden av ignoransens tvångströja, av ren samhällelig slentrian och fördom och likgiltighet. Och därför kvävs du, stackars fria ande, ödes syster och min tvillingsjäl, vars enda brott var kreativitet, Överbegåvningens dödsstämpel av abnormitet och anomalitet, förklarad tabu av normalitetens medelmåttighetsfördomars intighet. Anonymity, buried alive in the grayness of sterility, by the gravedigger and murderer of silence, in that indifference into which you were born, as in a vacuum which always was your own and followed you on as a persistent fateful foe of some relentlessness, since he never gave you up, no matter how hard you fought to get out of that grave of isolation and suffocation due to the lack of spiritual air. The soul was born free with wings of her own, but was never given any air to spread them out, but rather was shut up in the straight jacket of ignorance, like in a perpetual thraldom of obligatory indifference, of the society of humdrum prejudice and stifling fatalism and the stagnation of materialism that gave up to death. And therefore, my twin soul and sister of destiny, you are being throttled for your creativity, your only crime, that separated you from mortal mediocrity and given that stamp of doom for prejudiced abnormity and anormality, declared taboo by that commonness of normality, which can but bore us free and winged souls to death. The desperate lover, he came to me dissolved in desperation, 
No, I cannot stand it any more. I will no more be treated so by any lady. What is then the matter? What has happened? They just drive me nuts. But who? The ladies. Who else is so cruel and merciless? But all the other hopeless, mad, indecent and revolting sex. What have they done then? Is it more than one? One is more than enough. I try to soothe him. Tell me now, what has she done to you? She just keeps doing nothing. She is never there. She gives her word but never keeps it. She forgets her promises. She says one thing but does the opposite. She never keeps appointments. And she goes to bed with anyone but me. I see, said I. So you are jealous. Have you any proof of her unfaithfulness? It is enough for me to see her being fondled by her friends, her girlfriends and her lovers and the whole world, while I'm the only one to treat her decently. And since the whole world loves her and debases her, you are frustrated as her only true and decent lover and avoid her. Naturally, yes, my friend, you are completely lovesick. Yes, of course, that's the problem, and I cannot stand it any longer. She is completely unreliable. My friend, you are not first in history to find out love is not a stable thing. What will you do? That is what I'm asking you. What shall I do? You love her. That is all your trouble. Stay out of your love. Forgo her or continue suffering. That is your only choice. But why must love be so humiliating and give so much suffering? My friend, that is the question which no lover ever had an answer to. And I went back to work, preferring to stay out of any trouble, with frustrated lovers angry with each other. When love leads to jealousy, it is no longer love but only egoism, which can drive any lover out of love to any madness. The pathetic lover. Why can't I reach you? Why are you never at home when I come by? Don't you want to see me again? What did I do wrong? Or is it just that I'm too old? This pathetic old ridiculous fool is then good for nothing and unqualified for love and a thing to just sort out and forget all about. No, no woman's heart can be so cruel. There must be something else. Did I frighten you? That was the last thing I wanted to do. On the contrary, I always observed the strictest politeness to spare your delicacy and my own vulnerability, for no feelings are sorer than the faithful lovers, and no lover's feelings are easier to wound than an old one's. Or is it just so simple and vulgar that you prefer someone else, someone younger that you can dominate, Someone who doesn't flinch at making sex, but is prepared to make child with anyone. A vulgar playboy who doesn't care about his victims and forgets immediately whom he laid before. In that case, there is only disappointment and nothing else to say or do but to say farewell to love and consider oneself a pathetic, ridiculous failure, impossible to redeem or even to feel sorry for since he just gave up and fell a victim to his own vulnerability and the doubts of his misgivings, and was not made to receive love but only to give it away, thus making his life of love a constant bankruptcy, and whether it was worth it or not is a totally different story, said the old fool, and went away and fell in love again. Insecurity. Your insecurity is nothing to rely on, and neither is there any other security. Your feelings will ever play havoc with you, constantly resulting in surprising earthquakes, worse than any earth or catastrophe, whenever you are not prepared for it, and they will never leave you in peace, because they are always there, like hungry harpies and furies of the night just waiting to put their claws into your soul and make it bleed most painfully and copiously, 
until you cannot bear it any longer, but just have to clasp the knees of your friend and beg for mercy, like a criminal escaped to an asylum. And yet those feelings are better than being without any. Career hearts of stone are frozen stiff forever, and successfully established authorities are lost forever, having done their careers and having nothing to look forward to but death as the release of their feelings at last, which they buried alive in the bank walls of success, locked away forever, while the trembling leaf of an exposed and vulnerable soul will ever be free as long as she suffers from her feelings. Usäkerhet Din inre säkerhet är ingenting att lita på och inte heller finns det någon yttre säkerhet. Ty ständigt kommer dina känslor att förinta dig och ligga i försåt med överraskande jordbävningar långt svårare än någon jordisk katastrof och när helst du minst väntar det och aldrig ska det lämna dig i fred. Ty det finns alltid där som hungriga harpyor eller furior väntande i natt bara på ett tillfälle att hugga klorna i din själ och få den att förblöda ymnigt och olidligt tills du inte längre kan stå ut men måste lägga ut dig för din vän och be om hans förbarmande och skydd som en förlupen dåre sökande asyl. Men ändå är det bättre att stå ut med slika känslor än att vara utan dem ty karriäristens hjärta är en frusen sten och etablerade auktoriteter är förlorade för evigt, då de gjort sina karriärer och ej har något mera att se fram emot, förutom döden som den äntliga befriaren av deras frusna känsloliv, som de begravde levande i framgångens och självgodhetens bankvalv som de tappat nyckeln till, allt medan den utsatta och sårbara själens dallrande och spröda asplöv alltid kommer att få flyga fritt för vinden lika länge som hon lider frivilligt för sina känslor. A chance meeting You called me from afar across the wilderness of solitude and I was there to hearken and to understand your friend's song, a call which only the bereaved could understand, a song of love and languishment, of missing the beloved but without heart-rending pain. No tears was in that song but only loneliness, like from a crane got lost from her migrating flock, a cry of melancholic forlorn alien beauty, of such singular enchantment and intriguing personality that I felt recognized myself as something similar a hopeless case of alien nomadic yearning wildness, never quite at ease or peace with anyone, and least of all with my incurably outrageous self. So might two wolves make contact by a howling song across the frozen desolations of Siberia and find out to their immense surprise that they were not alone completely in this foreign universe. Skriet från vildmarken. Du kallade på mig långt bort ifrån den andra sidan av den vilda ensamheten och jag lystrade till sången och förstod den genast. Ty det var en sång som endast den förstår som känner sorgen. En sång av innerlig melankoli, försmäktande av saknad, men helt utan smärta, utan tårar, bara fylld av ensamhet. Som från en trana som i flykten kommit bort från flocken med ett rop av övergiven sällsam skönhet, av en sådan djup förtrollning och betagande personlighet, att jag själv kände mig som något liknande och träffad, som ett hopplöst fall av främmande nomadisk längtans vildhet, aldrig helt tillfreds med någon, alltid ensam i allt sällskap, minst av allt belåten och i ro med sitt outhärdliga jag. Så kan två vargar nå kontakt genom sin vildhetsklagan ylande tvärs över frusna tundror i Sibirien och till sin oändliga förvåning finna 
att det ej alls var helt ensamma i denna värld av främlingskap. Two old souls. We are two old souls, you and I, and I would place you more convincingly in ancient Greece, identified as something of a treasure of mythology, originating most exceptional creativeness as nothing less than as a perfect proper muse. Myself have roots there. I was born in ancient Greece, where both my heart and soul belonged from ancient times and always found their way back to return to, as to something of a mother's womb, but in a spiritual sense. That womb and fountain of perpetual life continuing still to nourish all humanity with dreams of charm and beauty. Thus we are to timeless souls, too old to ever get much older and to therefore stay forever young, retrieving and connecting to each other ever and again repetitively, maybe throughout history, to keep it going and to constantly remind humanity to never give up the creative and constructive mission which remains the most important task of life. Två gamla själar vi är två gamla själar, du och jag, och jag är nog benägen att placera dig i gamla Grekland och identifiera dig som ursprunget till all mytologi och källan till en högst märkvärdig kreativitet som icke något mindre än en sannskyldig gedigen musa. Även jag har mina rötter där. Jag föddes i antikens Grekland som mitt hjärta och min själ hört hemma i allt sedan dess och alltid återvänt till och sökt sig tillbaka till, som till något av ett moders sköte men i andlig mening, denna källa till oändligt liv som aldrig sinar, för att underhålla hela mänskligheten med sin skönhets charms och utsegliga drömmar. Alltså är vi två tidlösa själar, allt för gamla för att åldras mer och därför dömda till att alltid förbli unga, för att återfinna och förenas med varandra, ständigt återkommande, kontinuerligt, kanske genom all historien, för att hålla den igång och ständigt påminna vår mänsklighet om att det någonsin ge upp den konstruktiva skapelsens mission som är det viktigaste som vi har att göra här i livet. Memories of my first love You bring me back my first love just by your existence, with your long, amazing hair, exactly as my hippie bride of thirty years ago, who just like you enchanted all her world and made all men go drown themselves in craziness. Since then nothing has changed at all. I am still young and green, naive and potty, and consider the whole world my own since it is dancing all just for my love, and I am omnipotent as a lover, since I have you for my love, the only goddess of eternity, who keeps my love alive forever, just by existing, as my first perpetual love that never dies. Happy Birthday Our strange relationship is something of a miracle to me, that now is underlined and focused as I venture forth to celebrate your birthday. We are not together and have never been so, but are so the more for being separated, you in Russia, me at home at work, as if we never had been parted. How is our relationship to be defined? I am too old to be your lover or your husband, but too young to be your father. I am something in between, a friend in limbo of some undefined category, a nothing but a bit of everything, but could be anything, and would be willing to whatever you would want. So that would be my birthday present to you. I shall be to you whatever you desire. But the main thing is that our relationship is good. It has been good from the beginning and has constantly improved as long as we have known each other and let us just keep it so, allowing it to constantly grow even better. 
timeless lovers. We have no time for this relentless world of ignorance and cruelty and nonsense, like ridiculous atrocities and violence for nothing. So we stand outside it and are proud of that capacity of chronicle outsiders feeling sorry for this mess of worldly matters, vanities and follies, making politics a nuisance for all sensible and thinking men and women who should just refuse cooperating with this mankind and these men that only know the language of enforcement, of brute force, destructive hardness, self-destructive lunacy and idiocy. Unfortunately, most men in accountable positions suffer from this madness and should therefore definitely be subjected to some treatment, while the only sane and decent people have to step outside and sort this world out of their lives, to at all be able to devote themselves to all that matters in the long run, which is love. Tidlösa älskare, vi har ingen tid för denna skoningslösa värld av nonsens, ignorans och grymhet, så som löjligt våld för ingenting, så vi står utanför och kan däröver vara stolta, så som kroniska utbölingar som tycker synd om hela eländet av världsliga affärer, fåfingar, förryckthet och förgänglighet, som gör all politik till bara galenskap för eftertänksamhetens män och kvinnor som bör vägra samarbeta med en sådan manlig mänsklighet som bara kan forceringens och våldets språk, den självsvåldiga hårdhetens självdestruktiva vanvett. Till vår olycka så lider dock de flesta män i ansvarsfulla positioner av den galenskapen och bör därför tvång som händer tagas medan de får kloka och anständiga mänskliga undantagen tvingas att ta avstånd och förvisa världen ut ur sina liv för att alls kunna ägna sig åt det väsentliga, det enda som består och har betydelse i längden som är kärlek. Apollo and Aphrodite There was a scandal at Olympus as there suddenly arose a rumour that Apollo, of all gods, had fallen flat for Aphrodite, of all goddesses. And Dionysus laughed his sides off. Zeus and Poseidon shook their heads. Artemis just went off out hunting and would hear no more about it. Hera smiled benevolently, knowing well the weaknesses of gods and men. Athena just could not believe it, she was shocked, the only one to be so, while Apollo's brother Hermes, as the only one, decided to find out the truth about it. So he went to old Hephaestus and asked if his notorious wife had actually deceived him. Do you find that strange? Hephaestus asked. Do you not know that she keeps sleeping with just anyone? But even with Apollo, asked bewildered Hermes. Ask Apollo, answered the old limping smith. I have not had anything to do with it. So Hermes went to seek Apollo out, whom he found sleeping with the lovely goddess Aphrodite, both entangled in each other's masses of blonde hair, and all too evidently more than decently enjoying it. What's this? asked the frowning Hermes, folding up his arms. Have we not had enough of scandals here on Mount Olympus? And of all gods, you, Apollo, and with Aphrodite. Apollo turned to him with calmness, looked at him, looked at him carefully and asked, And would you, Hermes, miss an opportunity with Aphrodite if you got one? Why are you to envy me, a god yourself, my beauty and my love? And would you really dare, denying me or anyone the privilege of loving beauty just for beauty's sake, even if she is a whore and Aphrodite and another's wife? Good Hermes, leave me to my love and seek your own, for you shall know that even if I am the 
for you shall... Good Hermes, leave me to my love and seek your own, for you shall know that even if I am the chastest of the gods, enjoy the highest reputation of moral integrity, idealism and virtue, even I am subject to and must subordinate myself to love, the weakest of the goddesses, but all the same, the only omnipotent one, the power of whom everyone must bow to, even Zeus, which his wife can bear you testimony of. And even Artemis, my sister, although she remains a virgin, must accept that love alone rules all the universe, all life, the destiny of man and even of the gods, which you shall understand, if not before, when we, the gods, are gone, but love continues still. So quoth Apollo and turned back to Aphrodite's silent charm, to lose himself completely in her beauty, while his brother Hermes went away in brooding worries, for the first time contemplating the impending possibility of even the mortality of all the gods, but finally arrived at a conclusion. Yes, by golly, he is right. We must be mortal, yes, of course, unless how wise my brother is, we give ourselves to love since only love in this world must, of course, according to the most and only natural of laws, rule life and be the only immortality. And he turned back to Mount Olympus and told all the other gods that there was nothing wrong and that Apollo only knew the real way for them all to spite all history, survive their own mortality and ultimately end up defeating even time. Apollo no Aphrodite, Olympen rabbades av ännu en skandal, när ett nytt, när ett nytt rykte spordes, som berättade att självaste Apollon fallit platt av alla gudar och för Aphrodite. Dionysos kunde inte hålla sig för skratt, Poseidon liksom Zeus skakade på huvudet, Artemis ville inte höra mera utan stack i väg. Den överseende erfarna hera log som allt för väl bekant med mänskliga och gudomliga svagheter. Athena vägrade tro sina öron och var som den enda helt chockerad. Medan Hermes ensam, som Apollons broder, tog sig före att ta reda på vad som egentligen stod på. Så han begav sig till Hephaistos och frågade om faktiskt dennes ökända gemål bedragit honom. Finner du det då så konstigt, frågade Faistos, vet du inte att hon går i säng med vem som helst? Men att hon gör det med Apollon, svarade då Hermes konsternerat. Fråga honom, svarade den gamle lyttesmeden, jag har ingenting med saken alls att göra. Hermes gav sig då stad och sökte upp Apollon, som han fann i sängen hos den fagra Frodite, båda djupt insnärjda i varandras långa gyllne hår och allt för uppenbart i mer än anständig av njutning av sitt läge. Vad är detta? frågade då Hermes uppbrakt och med armarna i kors. Har vi då inte haft tillräckligt med skandaler här ibland oss på Olympen? Och av alla gudar du, Apollon, och med Afrodite? Då såg lugnt Apollon Hermes djupt i ögonen och frågade och skulle du då, Hermes, avstå ifrån Afrodite om du hade chansen? Vem är du att missuna mig denna skönhets kärlek? Och skulle du då på fullt allvar verkligen ha djärvheten att vägra inte bara mig men någon överhuvudtaget privilegiet att få älska skönheten för endast hennes skull om så hon var en hora, själv Afrodite och en annans hustru? Gode Hermes, lämna mig fred här med min kärlek. Sök din egen, och det ska du veta, att om jag så är den tyskaste av gudar med det högsta ryktet för moral, integritet, idealism och dygd, så är dock även jag i underordnad ställning när det gäller kärlek. Störst bland svagheter, men samtidigt den enda maktfullkomliga gudomligheten som vi alla måste ödmjuka oss inför, även Zeus, vilket Hera kan berätta om. Och till och med Artemis, syster min, 
fast hon förblir en jungfru måste acceptera kärleken som ensam härskare i universum. Över allt liv, över människornas öden och till och med över gudars. Vilket du nog ska förstå om inte förr när vi är borta medan kärleken består. Så talade Apollon och vände sin uppmärksamhet tillbaka till gudinnans tysta charm för att förlora sig fullkomligt djupt i hennes skönhet. Medan broder Hermes gav sig av försänkt i grubbel då han aldrig tidigare kommit att fundera på den möjligheten att till och med gudarna med tiden kunde visa sig bli dödliga men kom så plötsligt fram till en klar insikt. Han har rätt för sjutton, klart att vi är dödliga. Så vida inte vi hängiver oss åt kärleken, då endast kärleken naturligtvis i denna värld i enlighet med den alena helt naturliga avlagar måste helt bärska livet och alena ge odödlighet. Och han gav sig tillbaka till Olympen och förklarade för alla gudarna där stedes att allting var i sin ordning, att Apollon visste vad han gjorde och att han nu visade den vägen och den enda vägen för dem alla att i trots mot tiden och historien överleva dödligheten och så till och med besegra tidens gång för alltid. Variation Don't remind me of my first love. I was raped and killed and that was it. That is, my love was killed from the beginning by the evidence of hard reality and the annihilating fallacy of man resulting in a devastating disappointment of a supremest kind for life, a rape to be endured and re-experienced forever. How can love survive is my resulting lasting question, which will never have an answer. Love just gets on and survives, like life when it bursts through the toughest asphalt, with some tiny flower just for demonstration, and goes on like crazy, loving just for love's sake, just to prove its own impossible existence, with no smile, no tears, as stoic as a death skull but nevertheless with irresistibility, continuing to love like mad forever. The truth about the matter. The truth about the matter is that love, if true, is too deep to be properly expressed, and never therefore can be expressed enough, and therefore the truer and the deeper your love is, the more easily it gets misunderstood, and then starts the real process of introversion, broodings, without end and in eternity, the problematic analysis of what went wrong, which nothing really did. Love just got entangled in itself and by itself, got stuck like that famous interrupted coitus recently explained, was too deep and too true to get a form in reality, in brief, turned into a hopeless ideal, How do you solve that problem? It's just impossible. Love once turned into an ideal remains an ideal, and there is no cue for it, it just goes on forever, like a satellite launched into space to wander on forever, into nothing but with the most important message on board of all eternity explaining all the universe and holding within the innermost and deepest of all secrets of love itself. Sanningen om saken Sanningen om saken är att kärlek om den är rekta är för djup för att kunna uttryckas klart och kan därför aldrig uttryckas tillräckligt. Varför din kärlek ju sannare och djupare den är desto lättare blir missförstådd och då börjar den verkliga processen med introvertering och grubblerier utan ände i all evighet. Det problematiska analyserandet av vad som gick fel, vilket egentligen ingenting gjorde. Kärleken bara trasslade in sig i sig själv och fastnade som ett ofullbordat samlag och var för sann och för djup för att få plats i verkligheten och kort sagt helt enkelt övergick till ett ideal. Hur löser man det problemet? Det är helt enkelt omöjligt. 
När kärleken blivit ett ideal förblir den ett ideal. Och det finns ingen bot, den bara håller på och upphör aldrig. Liksom en satellit på blindkurs ut i rymden som bara ständigt fortsätter vidare mot ingenstans men med evighetens viktigaste budskap ombord med förklaringen till hela universums gåta som är själva livets innersta hemlighet. Untouchability. I find love to be an indefinable force that sometimes has no reason and therefore makes a wanting of it all the more desirable. By blue-eyed soul. Don't turn my love into some palpability, but let me keep it free from agony of coarse reality, and thus preserve it better as an indefinability, to cherish and feel free to cultivate without hostility from rivals, complications and outrageous culpability. Thus saith my love, you'd better not risk touching me, for then I might prove real. I will not touch my love but rather dream away from it and reach it better that way, since the language spoken into dreams is clearer and much more reliable than what all words in lies are able to express. There is no love but abstract love. There is no truth in love but in the soul. And love made concrete is one way into a trap where you get stuck and nothing more can save you until death restores your soul and freedom. So keep clean and out of love's more practical manifestations, and in that way you will manage to stay on in love forever. The Chat When we sleep together, you and I, and talk at length about forbidden things that no one ever heard of, and I venture in my sleeplessness to leave your bed to just escape our union for a moment, Something thought-provoking startles me, that you are not alone as long as I at all exist. This world, this universe, is just too small for us, and in the thawing warmth of our embrace, the whole world melts away, as just a negligible vanishing nonentity that our hearts are too full of love to even mind. While we alone exist, as some kind of a dualistic nuclear centre of existence, even while we keep apart. And at the same time, our love keeps all the world alive, as if it was dependent on the fact that we exist together. And thus can we go to sleep with a good conscience, having done our duty to the world by making love. Headaches and Heartaches, by the way, T.S. Eliot's birthday, 26th September. Another day of hell in desert land with hollow men, an outsider in exile, marked as alien and treated worse, an outcast lost in headaches and, what's worse, a bleeding heart. It could not really be much worse. Why does he then stay on? a lonely, isolated, frozen-out exemption from the greyness of this suicidal Hades. He has his work and sticks to it in fealty, although they never thank him for it, nor give any salary or recognition, but he just accepts it, shrugs it off and carries on, since even in the hopelessness of blackest hell you always find something to love the only universal cure for everything. All the offs. Don't remind me of the corpses, all the lost ones, all the accusations, all the failures, all that got away, all the exploded dreams, the cruelties and massacres, all the deceivers and the frauds, the vanished hopes, the deaths, the burials. Let me rest in peace for all the living dead that never can stop torturing you by being constantly dug up as agony reminders whenever they get the slightest chance. A divorce is worse than any marriage, for a marriage can be ended by divorce, but a divorce will ever haunt you, hunt you down and keep you on the rack forever.
the black hole of truth. Let's go away together on the ultimate and only valid journey out of this world, out of all reality, and leave all baseness and vulgarity behind to lose ourselves in wild, fantastic dreams of beauty, thickened with the perfumes of our love song that shall never end but constantly reach greater heights of withering astoundingness and glorious perfection. People say that life itself is nothing but a journey, and it has no meaning but for that especial element of being ever on the move away and forward, always onwards, often wayward, and the more the better, just as long as that trip never ends, but leads us on and carries us away into the abyss of oblivion, into that black hole of love and beauty, that will ultimately end up in a dawning new eternity. The worst and most painful jealousy. Jealousy is never worse than when it's justified, when others make the same claim of your love as you, when others act as if they were your doubles, manifesting the same feelings for your love as you transforming your life to a nightmare of outrageous clones, all those unworthy rivals utterly destroying what was yours, and killing off the harmony of what you thought was perfect love, continuously ruining your day and life and future, and you can do nothing but resign in gloom. For what can you do about others having equal human rights as you? It was your bad luck that they picked on your love. You have no right whatsoever to deny them any feelings, and to start some quarrel, have a fight, or challenge them to duels is now out of fashion and but childishness. You have to bear it, and if you are lucky, your love might discover that you, after all, was better than the others and the only worthy one. The kiss of death. Yes, it's possible to kiss yourself to death. When love is running out and ruining itself, when you are wasted and has turned your inside out, that is your heart and soul, so nothing else remains. Then you can still consume yourself by throwing yourself out into the final abyss, visiting the hell of dead and wasted lovers where they kissed themselves to death. And, mind you, they were not just ordinary kisses. Lips may meet and signify but shallowness and nothing. Lips may lie and put on shows like hiding behind lipsticks. But there is another kind of kisses, much more subtle, that are whispered in consummate silence privately by means of nothing but the element of honest thought. Those are the kisses which I here try to describe the secret loves that never manifest themselves in flesh and blood, the unexpressed desires, wishes unfulfilled, and dreams that never could come true, all those unwritten tragedies of love that never came to more than secret kisses from afar, sent by some wind horse wandering in darkness, the sincerest kisses ever, that will always carry through their message, spiting time and space to go on loving and to die of love forever. An old-time ballad. She had a wooden leg but was surprisingly efficient. The blokes could never do without her. She developed a technique of outstanding refinement quite unique for her profession, not to scare away the customers, but finally she did it just too well. A client could not let her go to others, so he gallantly proposed to her, and she could not afford to be without a husband, once she got this one chance of a lifetime. Well, on the wedding night she just broke loose, forgetting all restraints, and fellows of the bridegroom standing secretly to watch outside the window saw the blockhead screwing off his head like hell. The wooden leg had never been less of an obstacle, but, alas, there were some consequences. 
he picked up chips and splinters from his leg for fourteen days. The Closed Gate You are never there when I come for a visit. I am tired now of climbing fences. All these locked doors keep the wrong people away. How can you love and associate with friends and have some kind of human workable society if you need codes to enter every ordinary house? Is love then to be fenced away and kept by force away from every home? Is privacy synonymous with isolation then? In Orwell's brave new world, love is a dangerous disease that has to be resisted and exterminated and its medicine is pesticides and other drugs, preventing you from thinking properly, and human contacts is a menace to the order of society. The only culture is the mainstream brainwash, which is obligatory for everyone, and he who does not want it and who shuts it out is antisocial with a criminal potential and must be carefully be watched. The cameras in every street will spot him everywhere. I am so tired of this alienation of humanity in this society of unhumanity for order's sake and for security, for politicians to manipulate the easier, for the establishment of lies, hypocrisy and cynicism, and don't want any more to climb high fences, break up gates and force myself through locked and coded doors to only meet my friend who suffers in her loneliness like everybody else. The abstract beauty of your soul. The abstract beauty of your soul compels me to some apprehension for your frailty, like some precious old Venetian glass entrusted to my hands for my responsibility to care for and protect, and I will do so willingly and bind myself to that distinguished obligation, piously regarding it as my concern and mission, may be the most vital and important of my life. The secret of your charm is that you live by soul alone. Material values are non-entities to you, while you look only for the soul of man to bring it forth that is the best sides of humanity and of each human being. All that ever was of any good in any person, you awake to new life and thus can you thaw up any human heart and even recall frozen flowers back to life. My love was such a frozen flower, buried and suppressed since twenty years. And could I then stop loving you and go to sleep and lethargy again? When you are here to brighten up my life, impossible. Life was created to exist and must exist through love, if possible, forever. Apollo and Aphrodite, part two. Apollo lay with Aphrodite, never tiring of each other, but eventually they started to discuss the situation. What is love, my darling, really? asked Apollo. What a stupid question, answered love's own goddess. You don't talk about it unless you want to destroy it. But mustn't lovers talk about their love and their their rela but mustn't lovers talk about their love and their their relationship. But mustn't lovers talk about their love and their relationship. But that is not what love is. Love cannot be talked about, because you cannot understand it. It exists, and that is all. My darling, you intrigue me. Then the more important to discuss it and to have it understood. That is a challenge, then. You do not understand it, and you do not talk about it. You just give it and want nothing in return. It is the gift of Lear. It is the gift of life to manage and administer in such a way. It is the gift of life to manage and administer in such a way that you can never keep it for yourself but only handle it by giving it away. So it is not for keeping but for giving only. 
but can you hurt anyone with such a gift? That is the delicacy. Love is total trust. If you don't trust your love completely and can be completely open with her about everything, then your love is lacking. Did all men and gods you slept with before me trust you as much as I? They did, and I was not unfaithful to a single one of them, for I am love itself. What does your husband say about it? Nothing, for he loves me. But he never slept with you, and thus he might well be the one who loves me most of all. Is chaste and virgin love then higher and superior to any carnal love like ours? Yes, for there is no more powerful and potent lover than the one who never spends his semen. But can he be satisfactory? Not temporarily, but in the long run he outlasts all other lovers. But you ladies do prefer the proper temporary love in flesh and blood in bed, or don't you? Never count on that. The trust is all. Give me a lover like my husband, who has never slept with me and never been unfaithful, and who trusts me no matter with whom I go to bed, and I call him a better lover than the fairest and most irresistible of all efficient lovers. That concluded their discussion, and Apollo felt that he had had enough. He left her bed and went home to her working husband, where he laboured in his den and told him, Dear Hephaestus, I am sorry that I stole your wife from you, but I have learned the lesson how much better you are as a lover than myself. Hephaestus said, You must be joking. Not at all, Apollo answered. I, in all my beauty and my splendour and refinement, is a clown and dilettant in love compared with you, who with your limp and ugliness have never let her down in your respect and faith. We all have sometimes deprecated and despised her for her wantonness, and you, her husband, is the only one who never thought insultingly about her. That is love, and much more love than any lover physically can bestow on her. And fair Apollo left Hephaestus and his wife in peace, and never tried again to copulate with her, for he had learned his lesson about love and stuck to it. Vain Separation The first thing every morning that I see as I wake up is you, the more so, the more absent you are from my side. I cannot do without you, and therefore you never leave me, like a guardian angel always on her guard, to save us both from every danger that could possibly disturb our union of hearts, that once and permanently fused our souls to one. My mind and thoughts and soul and all are all of you, and there was never anyone to vie with that capacity. Yet still there is so much for us to do, and such a labour just to get to know each other, and to reach ourselves and understand our love, that is too deep for us to fathom by ourselves, since we are drowned in it once and for all. What went wrong? What went wrong? It pettered out, but never died, but many got completely lost on all those crooked ways, not only vanishing in drugs with permanent brain damage, like almost all the friends of Cassidy and Kerouac, but above all, in all those flummeries and weird deceptions, masked most commonly in saviour-like attractiveness, but all those movements of religion and philosophy with business interests, were naive and innocent compared with a political reaction when demonstrations were stamped down with brute police force and the FBI let all drugs loose to swamp the Woodstock concert in political premeditated purpose to commit and trap and rape the flower power movement into drug addiction. This was never proved nor disproved but the accusation has grown stronger with the years and also more persistent, loud and clear. 
Of course, war ruined everything. The Vietnam War in escalating madness after the assassination of John Kennedy, who at an early stage saw the necessity to stop it and who tried to do so, which was why he was assassinated by psychotics who could not accept it. Brought all America, the leader of democracy and of all nations, morally in disrepute and in disdain, the bottom reached, we thought, by Nixon, but alas, there were administrations worse than his, who stolidly refused to learn the lesson. Still, the hibernating hippies never stopped encountering new springs, the music constantly increased the flow, not even drugs could stop the freedom liberation of the mind, in idealistic aspiration, like an urge of irresistibility, for beauty, fantasy, constructiveness, creativeness and goodness. Love and truth and beauty never died and never will, but will go on exploding and refuting backward world order forever. Our case, our only problem as I see it, is that we don't ever seem to get the chance to talk out properly. There is so much I want to tell you, there are infinities of question marks, our friendship contains elements that need clarification, the abstractness needs some definition. I am too much kept away from you by work and obligations, and our intercourse is always interrupted by some mad disturbance, importuning like we never importune each other. That is our dilemma. We can't reach each other in this alien world of a deranged society, of alienated and environmentally disturbed and brainwashed people, where we seem to be the only sane and normal ones, since we can see the blindness of the others. Fortunately, we at least stand in some contact with each other, or we would be left alone in isolation with a mess of all humanity. For Phyllis, on her birthday, you went with me upon the hippie trail, once upon a time when we were young, in different worlds but in the same direction in the pursuit of idealism and beauty, to get drunk by life and get into extremes of it, walking tall and high and without scruples, brushing everything away that wasn't positive. And here we are still after 40 years and are still on that trail, pursuing happiness, idealism and beauty, since we never gave up that perhaps most vital quest there ever was in life. I never was a hippie on the outside, but the more inside me, with a soul more flippant than the worst of crazy horses, and my best friends were by far the most extreme ones, those who just did anything in pursuit of the same ideals. We have them still, whatever did get lost, they didn't, and we still have far to go, for many years, I hope, since for that quest the longest lifetime, even with a hundred birthdays, never is enough. Lost in the maze of love, the depth gets deeper all the time, the abyss is no longer bottomless, but virtually expanding into the relentlessness of the infinity of all the universe where you get lost, where there is nowhere any compass, any ups or downs or any straight road, but just an infinity of labyrinthic intricacy, with no hope of ever getting out again. But maybe that's the very meaning of the strange impalpability called love, that you should never get the hang of it, but just experience it as that amazing puzzle of impossibility and incredibility it is, and suffer for it equally as much as you enjoy it with the only obligation to just take it on, whatever happens, with a distant possibility to sometime, somewhere, maybe understand what it was all about. You love, but that's not all, but only the beginning of another universe. 
A hippie epitaph. Wherever did you go, my lovely lost one, the butterfly of warm and tender colours, always draped in veils like to enlarge your wings, the queen of hippies in those days, surrounded by a court of brilliant, beautiful admirers, a court that I accepted for my love of you and loved you, living up to that responsibility. We all were carried easily away by any love in those days. So were you when someone stole my bed with you in it. But I still loved you after that and wanted to sustain my faith. But you could never take it seriously and abjectly refused all further poems and all efforts for a reconciliation. Was it better then to turn to smoking and committing yourself only to the queerest bums? You had a child with your seducer and became a hard and bitter woman whom I never more could recognise as that sweet butterfly of only candid colours. Once or twice you tried again to turn to me in efforts to renew the loveliness we had, but I was working hard and could not sacrifice what ideals I had left to instability in love. Instead, since then, I only worked for love. En av dessa historier. Var tog du vägen, stackars vän, min fjäril med de spröda vingarna, som svepte dig i slöjor i blott varma färger, liksom för att höja och förlänga vingarna, en rottning på den tiden i ett hov av skönhet, omringad av vackra idealiska beundrare som jag fick ansvar för och levde upp till. Alla flög vi lätt iväg på kärleksvingar på den tiden, liksom även du, när någon stal min säng med dig på köpet. Men jag älskade dig fortfarande och ej mindre efter det. Men något brast i dig och du tog aldrig mera mig på allvar och vägrade mot aga flera dikter och såg ingen återvändo. Var det bättre då att gå och tända på och falla för det nedrigaste luffare? Du fick ett barn med din förförare och blev en hård och bitter kvinna som jag aldrig mera kände igen som den där ljuva fjärilen med långa varma vingar. Några gånger sökte du återuppliva vad som varit men jag fastnade i allt för hårt arbete och kunde inte offra för en kärleksinstabilitet det ideal jag hade kvar. Istället har jag sedan dess blott arbetat för kärlek. En av dessa historier. Var tog du vägen, stackars vän, min fjäril med de spröda vingarna, som svepte dig i slöjor i blott varma färger, liksom för att höja och förlänga vingarna, en rottning på den tiden i ett hov av skönhet, omringad av vackra idealiska beundrare som jag fick ansvar för och levde upp till. Alla flög vi lätt iväg på kärleksvingar på den tiden, liksom även du, när någon stal min säng med dig på köpet. Men jag älskade dig fortfarande och ej mindre efter det. Men något brast i dig och du tog aldrig mera mig på allvar och vägrade mot aga flera dikter och såg ingen återvändo. Var det bättre då att gå och tända på och falla för det nedrigaste luffare? Du fick ett barn med din förförare och blev en hård och bitter kvinna som jag aldrig mera kände igen, som jag aldrig mera kände igen som den där ljuva fjärilen med långa varma vingar. Några gånger sökte du återuppliva vad som varit, men jag fastnade i allt för hårt arbete och kunde inte offra för en kärleksinstabilitet det ideal jag hade kvar. Istället har jag sedan dess blott arbetat för kärlek. Socialarbetarens facit. Hur fick vi detta galna samhälle av vrak och utbrändheter överallt som bara går på piller, droger och tabletter och behöver psykiatriker och terapi mest varje dag om det ej super ner sig minst i perioder men helst hela tiden bara för att alls stå ut med detta onaturlighetens samhälle av isolering, övervakning och miljöförstöring George Orwells eget folkhem, 
det mest idealiska tänkbara där varenda en blir salig om det bara finner sig i skvalsamhällets järntvätt. Vilken flykt som helst från verkligheten görs berättigad i detta idealiska orwellska folkhem. Och det håller nästan på att bli det enda som folk har att leva för. Verklighetsflykten alltså. Vad som helst men bara inte mera gråhet. Låt oss alltså vara glada och stå ut med ständigt mera sten på börda. Bara för att underlätta livet för varandra och gå på några fint som vi lurar oss på detta enda liv vi har här på en pinne i den gyllene buren av George Orwells underbara folkhems idealiskhet för hemförlovning av för tidigt helt senil dementa fall av flinande utbrända idioter. Ambarado Richesse This law is very strange, that tells of the encumberment of pleasure, how the better off you are, the more you feel unhappy, and the more you have, the more you want and lack. If you are spoilt by everything you want, your life is ruined, and the higher you have raised the standard of your living, the more likely you will acquire dreadful illnesses, most being nowadays of having lived too well. While if you work hard and are poor and have to constantly fight with adversity, you'll probably keep well and healthy and much better off than all the rich ones, suffering from boredom, from the worries of their property and their possessions, from atrocious taxes and the turbulences of the stock exchange, and getting nothing for their woes and worries for their property and riches, but a most unwelcome premature heart attack or worse. Such is the wisdom of this world and of its ways, that all you strive for will backfire, and no matter how much you deserve, you will get only what you don't deserve. Denna lag är mycket märklig, som beskriver glädjens allvarliga konsekvenser, hur som ju mera gott du lever, desto mer olycklig blir du, och ju mer du äger, desto mera vill du ha och saknar du. Om du blir bortkämd med att få allt vad du vill så blir du helt förstört, och ju högre du har höjt din levnadsstandard, desto mera troligt kommer du att drabbas av förfärliga sjukdomar, då de flesta sjukdomar idag är sjukdomar av välfärd. Medan om du jobbar hårt, är fattig och får ständigt tampas med motgångar, klarar du mer troligt hälsan och långt bättre än de välbeställda, som uttråkade mest äger att oroa sig för sina rikedomar och sin egendom, för hutlösa taxeringar och börsens turbulenser, och får ingenting för alla sina sorger och bekymmer för sin egendom och sina pengar, utom en högst ovälkommen allt för tidig hjärt attack om inte något värre. Sådan är den världens otransakliga visdom och dess gång att allt du strävar efter slår tillbaka och vad du än har förtjänat får du bara vad du aldrig har förtjänat. The wayward ways of love Sighing and dying for your sake I languish in my hell of love but do it gladly since I know too well how fortunate I am to suffer for your sake, you being what you are, a goddess, not of love, but of the force behind it, the motivation, the creation and the cause, a queen of beauty but combined with feelings, all a trembling tenderness of sensitivity, a cluster abyss of intoxication, wondrously consisting of too much of everything, a hopeless overwhelmingness of beauty above all, to which we all must fall in adoration and dependence and the ultimate addiction to the ultimate ideal of indefinability. The comfort of maltreated ladies. A lover's soul is always full of tears, but he can never shed them for they are not tears that flow that easily, like water, but must needs some treatment to at all have any proper outlet. There is one possible treatment only, 
and that is the poet's temperament that transforms those precious tears into the costliest jewels as a never-ending flow of riches from a cornucopia of beauty only for the pleasure of man's virtual eyes and for the comfort of maltreated women who in poets' tears transformed into dreams of beauty find a love of greater worth than any man's discharge of natural brutality. Misshandlade damers tröst. En älskares själ är alltid breddad med tårar som man inte kan utgjuta. Ty det är icke tårar som flyter som vanligt vatten men måste särbehandlas för att kunna få utlopp. Det finns bara ett sätt att behandla dem och det är genom det poetiska temperamentet som filtrerar och ombildar dessa ovärderliga tårar till de ljuvligaste juveler av oförgänglig skönhet som flödar ut av ett outsynligt ymlighetshorn bara till glädje för läsande ögon och till tröst för misshandlade damer som i poetens tårar omvandlade till drömmar av skönhet finner en kärlek av djupare värde än mannens grovhetsyttringars brutalitet. To be in love. Can you be driven to madness by love? It happens too easy. A few sleepless nights only, missing your love and your lost. Not an animal caught in a trap in a pit is so helpless and destitute as he who is in love but without his beloved. Turn around with your sighs in your sweated bed, you ridiculous fool, for never you'll get her since you are so stupid to love her too much. There is no self-tormentor more miserable than the lover in loneliness who dares, not to, who dares not to love his beloved, who dares not to cry out his madness, who dares not admit his all-too-human weakness and his foremost privilege being a man to be simply in love. The dependence of independence and vice versa. Sorry, love, I cannot do without you. I was born a free man and an even freer spirit, and I always cherished and kept safe my independence. Many girls refused me since I was too independent, but then there was you, an equally nomadic independent spirit, living, as it seemed, on just her independence, free and totally emancipated as a feminist, and neither of us wanted ever to pay p- f- and neither of us wanted ever to fall prey to thraldom, not in any way, and least of all in some traumatic sadomis- sadomis- sadomasochistic bondage. And neither of us wanted ever to fall prey to thraldom, not in any way, and least of all in some traumatic sadomasochistic bondage. Still we need each other, but as independently dependent on our co-dependence. Freedom is the guarantee of our souls to never become subject to another. So we can be co-dependently dependent on each other only as completely independent, if you see my meaning, which is rather simple and not difficult at all. And that is maybe the right key to every happy and successful couple and relationship that they remain completely independent as dependent on each other. The true lover. It's not you I do not trust. It's all those other fellows, all those swarming men around your bed, all those invited to your side to help you on the way to have some fun, all those who just are out for kicks to use the opportunity and to use you for unknown ends, but selfish motives always end up badly, usually for both the bastard and his victim. For unknown ends, but selfish motives always end up badly, usually for both the bastard and his victim. But I love you anyway, and that you can be sure of, that no one in the world can love you more than I do, so I don't mind all those other phonies, whether they are fucking you or not. 
I just keep clear out of their way, cause I don't want no trouble with my love or with her lovers, since my troubles with myself and with my feelings, honestly, are quite enough. The Grey Hairs Each time you see her, alive or in memory, you shall acquire in richness another grey hair, that being in logical law the most natural wages of love. No one loves more without sense and more blindly than aged poor old fools, with no more on their heads than the whiteness and baldness of suffering endless experience. But he who is young and without any single white hair has not loved anyone but himself yet. With pain and with suffering only, with a full desperation of unfair defeat, bolting blindly in madness, in the depths of dishonour and blackness of hell only, real love will gradually come to be learned, which is not of this world, but which colours you white like from ashes and snows, and which purges the colours away from your hair. Madness. Some call it madness, others call it love. Some call it anger, others call it instability. All those feelings that play havoc with you, that result in outbursts for good or for worse, that neither you nor anyone else can control, that oversensitivity that people tend to suppress under fraudulent masks of scruples killing all honesty. No, let the madness out if it be madness. Freud was right, you can't keep anything in, and least of all the truth of ordinary human feelings that simply have to be expressed. Or the stones themselves will start crying, the weather exploding, the earthquakes arising. Your feelings are holy, no matter how mad they may be. And the only way to be human is to express your feelings. Some criticism at last is due. The challenge of the Ten Commandments. They are not really any true commandments, but eight prohibitions and two recommendations. The ancient Greeks had only one commandment, but they never put it down in writing, since they knew man's fallacy enough to be aware that he would never be obedient to common sense. Their one commandment was a hint at a recommendation that one should not dedicate oneself to hubris, which man ever did as long as he made history. Since then, no more commandments were imposed on man, since he preferred to constantly go mad with hubris and to violate the Ten Commandments, most especially the first and wisest, oldest one, the one that said, Thou shalt not kill. The history of mankind boasts the testimony that he never could have heard of that commandment. Older than the Ten Commandments was the fundamental message of the oldest writs of man in ancient India in the Vedas, where it is expressed not only in the Kama Sutra, the necessity, the necessity to live by love alone. Well, well, that message clearly also was forgot from the beginning, or the men that made this earth a constant battlefield did never hear about it, as they never could learn anything. Compassion. Requiem för döda älskare. En ung flicka, Eunice, omkom i en bilolycka. Hennes älskare, Joshua från Mexiko, ville inte leva utan henne och sköt sig. Compassion Requiem for Dead Lovers Let me share your tears and blend them with my own. There is too much to always cry for, and the oceans never can get full of all the human tears, although they overwhelm the ocean waters with their saltiness, since there is no end to sorrows and no bottom to their abyss. The sorrow fountain being constantly replenished, 
and the waves of tears irrevocably growing and increasing like tsunamis in their overwhelmingness and irresistibility. And there is no sorrow deeper than when love is dying, the supreme momentum there of being suicide for love. Here falls the silence. Words cannot express the grief. The tears will choke all voices into silence, which will boom with the appalling overwhelmingness of death re-echoing in all eternity. For there is no sound or power more tremendous than the silent grief and sorrow for a true love that was lost. Varför diktar man när orden ändå inte räcker till? När döden kommer så som allra mest olämpligt, mitt i kärleken när blomman ska slå ut, blir tystnaden öron bedövande till orthärdighet och gråten stockar sig i halsen för att fastna där för gott. Den gråt som kunde ha fyllt oceaner och gjort dessa dubbelt saltare med all sin bitterhet och fått dem till att svämma över universum fast den deras gravar redan är så bottenlösa. Ingenting är bottenlösare än sorgen och det finns ej sorg så bitter och så djup som den som fyller universum med sitt dån av otärlig tystnad i all evighet inför den sanna kärleken som dog. Shyness. The gag and the straight jacket coming from shyness are far more efficient than those of a lunacy ward. The tyrant of shyness called reasoning sense will not let any word cross your teeth's fence to freedom that might risk delivery of any feeling of honesty. What shall we do with our feelings, then, which still are there crying out in the prison of shyness, tethered behind seven armoured gates of common sense? No matter how reason ordains and securely rules over the world, bragging perfect control with the power of absolute force, it is never more powerless in all its absolutism against the simple truth and eternity of human feelings. Some love declaration. I love you. What on earth does that mean? It means that you are my only love, that I can't love another, that you are the only one included in my love life, and that my life without you is no life. You are half my life, and this half is but half without it. So what can we do about it? That's the question. We just have to stand each other, live in the same world, and do the best of it. There's nothing else to do. Catechism or catharsis? Both. The drunkard's catharsis. You know that it's bad for you, but you have it anyway. You know it's self-humiliating, but still you have it. You know it makes you more rough and vulgar and cheap, and still you have it. You know it worsens your company with yourself, and still you have it. You know it will ruin the following day, and that you won't feel nicely afterwards. You know that you only ruin and decapacitate yourself, and still you do it. You know it gradually burns out your brains, and still you have it. You are a teetotaler, an anti-drug campaigner, a strained purist making efforts, You are the chastest of Puritans, and still you have it. It definitely tastes bad like something between piss and shit, and still you take it. You ruined your intestines and fart bloody liquids. You suffer a lot and can't stand it really, but still you take it. When you piss the green and red stuff burns in your prick, you call, but you can... When you piss, the green and red stuff burns in your pick, but you continue anyway. Others will suffer for you, but still you continue. You are incorrigible, and still you drink, although you know it's all wrong, and you sober up just to start drinking again. Why then do you keep on drinking? Just because you are only human.
all at sea. What care I about art and craft, as long as I'm honest and have feelings to express with some sincerity that is worth while expressing, and to make it properly expressed correctly in my soul, and to make it proper, and to make it properly expressed correctly is my sole ambition, not allowing any strange pedantry to interfere. It is much more important to keep focused as the pilot on a wayward ship blown off the ocean, no one knowing where we are or on what course we are. This ship of love with tattered sails and without any charts to follow, leaking from a million wounds and worries, and with nothing safe at all to hold on to if we should sink, except our valid friendship. That alone is all the safety in the world, and as long as you have friends to turn to, and your love is nothing but a friend, no storm can blow you anywhere but home. A divided combination or a combined division. What's the difference between loving you and loving my ideals? Is there a difference? Yes, but merely a subtle one. You being so much of a soul yourself, with spiritual nourishment for your basic living and your main sustenance for survival, while of course ideals are always higher than what anything can be in life on earth. So am I then unfaithful to you for preferring my ideals, or am I unfaithful to them for loving you? A combination is the only answer. I could love you both, and in the one embrace the other, and make my ideals find outlet into you, and find you one of my ideals. That would, in fact, be the ideal love. You are like a drug to me. You are like a drug to me. As soon as the effects are gone, you only long for more, for seeing you again, for being with you, sharing your good spirit and your joy again. You are my glass of wine, without which I can't live much longer, in this dreary snake pit of consistent misery, with more complaints for every day and tragedies galore that constantly grow worse. Your friendship only makes this life endurable, the drug of life, the only joy, the sharing with another, anything outside yourself, forgetting all you know about reality, at least for the time being, in the better company of someone else. The Board A girl I used to know 23 years ago, She's still alive, by the way, and hasn't changed at all. An ugly old cow in a nightgown and challenging hips walks thus out in the street, dressed in slippers, to swing them around just to make people watch, swears and spits like a man, her vulgarity worse than a pimp's, treating every man worse than a dumbbell with no respect except for virgins chain-smoking, almost like some intermittent volcano, and boozing but coffee except wine or port brandy, whisky or spirits, can stand any stuff having guts made of iron and steel, hardly reacting at all to her burning them out systematically. But this board is a reader. She has education like nobody else, with a limitless library and no end to all her languages, English, French, German and Spanish, is a conversation and brilliance of wit, and she reads the most difficult literature in five tongues. Her most favourite darlings are Pasternak and Stefan Zweig. What intelligence, what a magnificent talent! And all this concealed beyond such a facade of vulgarity, those seven layers of paint and those curtains of cannabis smoke, buried under that permanent booze of wine, brandy and whisky, and that sordid traffic of creeps, crawling creatures called men. My dear heavenly muse of such splendid distinction and wisdom, who pushed you down in that alley, who turned you thus on, and who made you thus thwarted grotesquely? 
And why was not I allowed into your presence before thus your soul was so unjustly buried, beneath heaps of memories and disappointments, of love stories turned into such bitter sadness, of corpses remaining forever? The Private Hardliner You must believe me, I do love you, but what can I do for you? This society we live in being as it is, with no acknowledgement or recognition, salary or any notice of hard workers in the field of spiritual creation like ourselves, and no awareness, only ignorance of the importance of what we are working for. So what can I do but continue working hard for nothing but the more persistently in obstinate timidity for beauty, truth and love in poetry and music? I don't care if this society will crumble in pathetic self-destructiveness. I will continue spiting it and time and fashion all the same by just continuing to work constructively, ignored by all the world and time, but for the satisfaction of my soul, if nothing else.